Hey everybody, welcome back again to Ken Tamplin Vocal Academy where the proof is in the singing. Um, we have a really cool session today and it's how to sing in pitch or actually, uh, you know, people have different pitch for different reasons but um, I want to say how to sing in pitch is maybe one of the biggest most difficult and uh, arduous slash discouraging things people go through uh, to the point of where they actually give up and it's really lame. So um, I want to be encouraging about it, but I have some very, very cool practical information for all of us to help us get um, not only just to sing on pitch, but to sing great and then how that can expand into other things. So uh, before we get started, I want to go ahead and see we've got Eric uh, Lundstad, Lundstad um, on Facebook. Good to see you. Jennifer from Facebook. Good to see you too, Jen. Uh, uh, Olivia, uh, who's still eating popcorn. <laughs> Hi, Olivia. How you doing? Uh, let's see. Come on, gang. Bring, bring it in. Tell us where you guys are coming from. Just d Don't just say your name so people can see that it's from all over the world. Now, um, there's there's a, a, while we're getting started here, I want to make a couple comments. I've had, I literally, honestly get this almost daily, and that is, you know, Ken, when I sing and I record myself, is that really how I sound? Unfortunately, the answer is yes, <laughs> but that's a good thing because then we can hear where we need to improve and how to improve. So we're going to talk about that in a minute, but we got Florida tuning in, Beth Hayes from uh, Maine. Hi, Beth. Uh, John Speechley from Canada. Good to see you, John. We've got, oh, from America. Whoa, that's far away. Um, Iowa, uh, Georgia, got Jersey in the house. John Luke, good job, man. Uh, Iran, how you doing, Iran? Mohammed from Iran, Sam from California. Boy, you got a tough time in California right now, don't you? Uh, you you got a governor that's going to sell a billion dollars worth of masks and make you keep wearing them until he's got his money. <laughs> Spain. We got more Spain, more California, more California. Uh, got Tracy. Tracy's my awesome buddy who helps out a lot with my Facebook. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, we got Brazil. Fabio from Brazil. Uh, Joey Taglish. Uh, what's up in New York? Got bringing in New York. Holland. Florida. Sable from Mexico. Um, awesome. Italy. Ohio. Wow, that's uh, definitely an another planet unto its own. India, uh, and so forth. So anyway, gang, I got a lot to cover here. So just keep telling people where you guys are tuning in from. And uh, like I said, I have had this, I would say this and maybe singing with distortion, but maybe this more is probably the biggest area people feel they have issues with. Okay. Now, not, and there's subcategories of this too, because if someone has problems with pitch, um, they also think that they sound froggy or they don't have good tone or they're very monotone or, and or, and or whatever. Right. But it kind of starts here. And if you don't have this, people get discouraged and think, well, I'm just going to give up. I guess I can't sing. Thing. Well, that's just not true at all. And you would laugh if you guys only knew the pitch problems I had growing up and, and, and also learning different environments um, for pitch, whether it's singing live and the band is too loud, um, whether it's, it's singing in a room that's really muffled and you can't hear yourself, singing outside, completely outside where your voice goes away and you can't hear your voice at all. Um, I think I shared one time with you guys... Um, this little story, and I think it's kind of fun maybe to reminisce on this, is uh, I was singing the national anthem one time uh, for an LA Galaxy game. In fact, it's the big soccer team in, in California. And it was at the LA Coliseum. And so it was a giant event. And there was like 80,000 people there. And when they sound checked me, um, they actually put me at the 50 yard line. And I was on the side outside of the, you know, of the field itself. They sound checked me on the outside. And I did my sound check. And then when they actually had me sing the anthem, they put me in the center of the field and left my monitor way out on the sideline. I couldn't hear a thing other than the reverb coming back in off the speakers. Absolutely terrifying. However, I have had many a time, it's kind of like the way I referred to this movie Slumdog Millionaire and I had a friend from India say, oh man, I hate that movie. It's, it, it shows the poverty in India. And I, I guess I didn't even really relate to the poverty in India. I related to the story of how this young boy had encountered so many life experiences that when he was asked these questions on what was the American uh, television equivalent of uh, who wants to be a millionaire, it was called Slumdog Millionaire, he was able to answer these questions from life's experiences. So um, I too have had a lot of that in my life. So in this particular case, I um, I had sung into a lot of reverb tanks for fun, for effect, and. Um 
And so I was able to uh, remember the times where, wow, I remember a time I was recording this song and I wanted an effect and I didn't want to hear any original vocal. So I had to sing into only reverb or only delay and get my pitch on in order to be able to accommodate that. And this just brought me instantaneously back to that moment. And it also brought me back to a lot of moments where when I did a lot of touring and we were in hotels, I wasn't allowed to warm up in the hotel um, loudly. So I'd stuff a pillow in my face and I was very careful had to warm up with a pillow where I couldn't hear the actual audio itself. I could only hear what was coming in my ear, my inner ear, uh, the equilibrium inside my head, um, so to speak. And so uh, that helped me a lot with that event. I did a really good job and I got lucky, so to speak. But I love, again, what Jack Palmer said, luck, uh, when he was called out and he said, you know, yeah, you know, 20 years of playing in the U.S. Open golf tournament. That was a lucky, lucky shot getting a hole in one. Jack says, well, been doing this game for 20 years. And uh, the more I do it, the luckier I get, right? So anyway, we're going to continue. Now, people have different uh, pitch problems or different reasons for pitch problems. So I'm going to ask uh, answer some questions at, at the end of this, guys. So hang on with any of the questions. And if you have a question, please make it directly related to this subject because I want to cover this because, again, it's probably the most uh, requested and most Things, a cons- biggest concern of people that want to learn how to sing or that do sing and, and uh, sing out of pitch for different reasons. Okay. So I first want to discuss uh, more common ones and then I'm going to break it down from there. Okay. Uh, very few people are actually completely tone deaf. Let me say this again. Very few people are actually completely tone deaf. Now, I'm not saying there aren't those guys that exist and you're, you're, you're out there right now going, yeah, Ken, you don't me. I'm, t- you don't know me. I'm tone deaf. Hang in there. Come along for the ride of this. I think it's going to be worth it to you, okay? Check this out. In fact, by the way, uh, strangely enough, most people remember songs from their past, right? A nostalgia, something that connected with a moment, a a first kiss, a a hand-holding thing, the first concert you went to, whatever. But most people remember songs from their past and, and by memory, and it's proof that that at least starting with the mind that we can retain memory, whether we can reproduce the memory or the melody, excuse me, we can retain melody, whether we can re- uh, reproduce the melody or not, that's a different issue and we're going to cover that too. But what it means is, is that your brain can, can absorb and retain a melody that you've heard years ago. It's how you're able to recognize it, right? You're going to say, no, no, I can't, can't. No, no, no. Hang in there. If you had a song that you love from way back when and you could recall it in your mind, you may not be able to sing it, but you can recall it in your mind. That means the mind retains the note values in the memory. Okay. So you start there. So the mind has to get the body to reproduce this mechanically. That's where there's a disconnect and that's where there's other things we're going to discuss. Okay. So I, I, I want to go through this because like I said, very few people are tone deaf and your memory is proof of that. But here's what I mean. Even if someone can actually not articulate a melody orally, they can actually hear the melody and the intonation, not just the melody, the intonation in their head. Why is that important? Well, it's important because when you're hearing a melody, all melody is intonations of some sort. It's a frequency that you hear in your head, right? And by memory, you're not even actually hearing an aural or an audible uh, melody outside. It's, it's in your head, it's in your mind, it's stored in your memory bank. So why that's interesting is, is that your mem- your memory, your mind can actually store note values. Interesting, right? So you just thought you said, well, I'm completely tone deaf. Well, maybe deaf to the ear for being able to reproduce a sound, but hold on, we're gonna get to that. The next thing is, um, it becomes more of a mechanical issue of getting that melody out of your head and into your vocal folds and out in the open, okay? So remember, we all have melody, all of us. We all can retain melody. We all can hear the pitch of melody. Here's what I mean by that, because some people will, they'll start a melody and they'll go way off pitch and this and that. That's actually not necessarily true either. Probably 95 or 98% of the people out there that even think that they're tone deaf or can't uh, hold a melody can hold the pitch in their mind. Think about that. They can hold the pitch in their mind. They just can't reproduce it. In other words, if you think, well, the minute I start to sing, I, I have lousy pitch, therefore I'm going to go off key and I can't sing. No, 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 no. Let's back it up. One equation. If the mind can hear the melody in its original pitch or in a pitch that's consistent, and it does do that, it doesn't have the capacity to go out of pitch. Isn't that weird? 
Your mind, unless you kind of have something that you're struggling with or or you're or you retrain it, let me give you a quick example of this. Um, let's say you're singing into a microphone. Let's say you're a good singer. You're singing into a microphone and you're you're grooving along and you're in pitch and you're checking uh, some lyrics on YouTube and and the original version on YouTube that you're checking uh, uh, is down maybe two cents, three cents below the pitch and what you're singing into is in pitch. So you're singing in pitch right and then you play this thing and it's below pitch and then when you try to go back and sing in pitch all of a sudden you struggle to get back in intonation to get back into pitch so some people would say see can there right there no the memory doesn't store it blah 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 no actually the memory has been retrained by listening to this other thing over here to have to go back and retrain it once again to listen to the original pitch I was trying to sing into. I know this might sound complicated, guys, but stay with me on this, I promise. It's gonna be really cool. So in other words, we can retrain the mind uh, to do all sorts of things, but if we've repeatedly listened to an old song that we love multiple times, it's stored in our memory, and we can find a way to reproduce that sound. Even if we retrain the brain to reproduce it in a different key that can, uh, is compatible with your voice, okay? So, all right, now, the reason this is an important place to start because it also becomes an issue of confidence, all right? It's just, okay, well, I've got this melody in my head. How do I reproduce it? Can't get it to work. Therefore, I suck, I can't do it, and I lose confidence. So if we understand that confidence is key in believing we can do it, trying to do it, taking necessary steps to do it, and then little by way, you know, one baby step at a time, chipping away um, at this, you know, problem that child that we have. But believing that we can't do it is going to kill us. Believing we can means we can overcome this. So most people, and I do mean most people, can sing along with a song on the radio. So if you're humming along, you're in your car or, you know, whatever, you're doing your workouts, whatever, you can hum along. Now, People with headphones on usually seem miserably awful as they think they're singing to a song on the radio. They're not matching the tones and people are like watching this runner go by going, right? And they're nowhere, you can't even make out the song they're singing because they're just, you know, bellowing out. That's because they can't hear themselves. Did you hear me? I said, that's because they can't hear themselves. So they can't match up what they're hearing in their head, whether it's a melody that's in their memory banks or something they're listening to with headphones on, and I'm gonna get to that in a minute. They can't match the uh, what's going on in the room, right? The, the, the ambient sound in the room or outside or whatever it is. They can't match the intonation of that sound with the sound in their head, okay? So that's a hearing issue relative to what you hear in your head. So it's confidence and it's, it's, it's matching the tonal qualities. Now. Uh, most people, like I said, can sing along with the radio. So when you're in the car and you have a pitch reference that's in the same environment, stay with me on this, guys. I promise this is cool. It took me a long time to learn this stuff. So if you're singing a melody that's in the same environment as a melody that's being played back, whether it's a stereo, you're in your house, something on, on your computer, in your car, or whatever, you can find your way to somewhat is even the most tone deaf people to matching a lot or if not a lot, all of the tones that are being played to them so long as they're in the same environment. Now, not in a different environment, not with the headphones on and I'm gonna get to that. So so you, so they're, they're, so you can sing along with the radio, you can sing along with a YouTube video, you can sing along with other sources that are, are outside as long as you have the confidence to sing into the ghost vocal of someone else. In other words, so long as someone can lead you around by the nose or teeth or whatever in that melody, you can find yourself singing in the melody because it's being supported by someone else. Someone's carrying the load for you melodically and you can find yourself singing in the melody. Guess what? It means you can sing in pitch. You are not tone deaf, okay? And even those that can't can still do this. So let's continue. Now, um, where it becomes an issue is when you remove the ghost vocal, the original vocal that is being played back, um, and then you find yourself singing alone and you have to sing you know, solo, okay? Then you start to waver in your pitch. Well, it's confidence and it's not having this master vocal to follow to show you where your pitch is supposed to be, okay? So that's a training issue. 
That is a training issue. That's not an, a, 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 an inability or something that you can't do, okay? So let's, let's be clear about this as we're going. And we gotta be honest with ourselves too. I mean, this takes work. It's not like, oh, okay, well, you know, blah, 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 remove the vocal, I am hear it, I'm in pitch, it's all in my mind, I can pull this up. No, there's definitely some mechanical stuff we're gonna go through and, and we're gonna talk about that too. But if people become timid, then they lose confidence, and then the question of the tuning in their voices is subject. Can I really do this? Now, even though what I'm about to suggest overcoming this might be hard to put together, it's something that's really cool, okay? Now, this is original Ken Tamplin information stuff I've done, and I want you guys to consider doing it, and I'm no sooner gonna put this video out and all of my competitors are gonna say that they thought of this, and they're gonna say they did it first, but notice the date on my video when you see they, when they repost their videos. Uh, just a side, little side humor there. Um, and Anyway, so check this out. I want you guys to consider something. If we had a song that we knew and that we loved from our past, something that's, that, that's already embedded, right? Not something we have to learn, whatever, but something we know well. All right, now, and let's take that song and let's say we can sing into that song no problem. Now, I'm gonna suggest to you not to pick songs that are, have a lot of range because the more range, the harder it's gonna to be to find the melody, the harder it's gonna to be to, you know, to, to get pitch, okay? So find a song that you remember that you love that, and it could be you know, Leonard Skinner, it could be the Beach Boys, it could be, you know, I don't care, Adam Lambert. I don't care what it is. Probably not him because he usually uses a lot of range, but something that's really simple, okay? Start there and do this for me, and it is gonna blow your mind. Check this out. You're gonna take, and you're gonna go to karaoke-version.com. Karaoke-version.com. And you're gonna go to the top of Karaoke Version, and you're gonna click on the section that says Custom Backing Tracks, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> now, Karaoke Version, especially their newer stuff, has a lot of pretty decent instrumental tracks and it's known for its instrumental tracks for singing karaoke, right? So now this karaoke version has this custom track thing where when you click on it for $2.99, it will give you a menu of the original mix that they had, right? All laid out in tracks and you can mute any one of the tracks or you can raise or lower the tracks. It is awesome. It is awesome. So what you can do is, I want you to do this first. So pick a song, they have a huge library. Pick a song that's easy, that you remember from your past, right? That you may even had a little trouble singing, that's fine. Pick a song, I want you to get this karaoke version, call up the song, do the 2.99 thing, there's two versions. There's a 99 cent one where you can just get the, the original uh, track, karaoke track with a guide vocal, and then you can also get it without the guide vocal. Don't get that version. Get the custom track version, I'm gonna explain why. Now, you're gonna take all of the tracks and you're gonna bring them down to almost nothing. You're gonna have just enough wallpaper to be able to know what your cues are so that when the vocal comes in, you'll know where the vocal is, okay? So you're gonna do this and you're gonna just have this blaringly loud lead vocal track that you're gonna try to sing into. So instead of trying to sing to your favorite song on the radio, this is gonna be even a little bit more difficult because you're gonna have to match the intonation of this vocal a little more precisely. And I want you to practice this and I want you to get your phone out or whatever recording of device that you've got and I want you to try to ghost and track Trace, I don't even want to use that word in today's day. <laughs> You're going to trace the vocal and they're going to trace you to your house and make sure you got your vaccinations. No, sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, you're going to trace this vocal and you're going to literally like like two engines, like we've talked about a Cessna, you remember the Cessna aircraft engines, when they start to line up, and they line up, and they're in unison, and they're harmonized, or they're in unison together, you're gonna do the same thing with a vocal, and start with just a verse, don't go through the whole song, start with just sections, and record it and listen back, record it, listen back, and see if you're in tune. So follow this this vocal that you know, that's you know notorious in your mind, that you, you can't forget, right? And you're gonna follow this vocal, and you're just gonna find the simple pitch of the vocal. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna bring back all of the instruments back to normal, okay? And you're gonna still see, and you're gonna record it again. And you're gonna see how well you fare, how well you do. Once you record this vocal, you're gonna listen back and go, wow, okay, it's about the same as when the vocal was loud and I couldn't really hear the instruments. Now why this is important too is if you, if you can, 
You can remove the instruments completely if you want. By the way, they don't charge you extra for every time you download a different version. You can download this 100 times if you want. That's what's really cool. For three bucks, $2.99, you can do this as many times as you want. Super cool. Download the MP3, put it on your phone, your computer, whatever, go to town, okay? So anyway, so as you, as you start to do this, if you can do it with no instrumentation at all, even better, because then you can really have no pitch reference no tuning pitch reference, meaning the music, and all you are is just naked with this other vocal that you're trying to match the tone with, okay? Now, I'm gonna get into more other things we can do on this, so don't worry, this isn't the only thing, but so now what we're gonna do is, so you're gonna do this, and then incrementally, you're gonna have this, this you know, you brought all your tracks to normal, your vocals at normal, you're going along, okay, that's fine, it's just like it was when it was loud. Then you're gonna back it off by about 20%, where it's kinda, Kind of hard to hear, okay? Just 20% or so, a little hard to hear. You're gonna record yourself again and you're gonna see how you did. And you're gonna go, wow, I didn't do so bad. I didn't really need that vocal there that loud after all. Then you're gonna back it off to where it's almost inaudible. Just a, just a faint ghost or a notion of that melody. And then you're gonna record it again and you're gonna go, hey, that's, I didn't do too shabby, that's not too bad. And then finally, you're gonna take the vocal out all together and you're gonna use just the instrumental version of the song and you're gonna practice that and record it. And it will blow your mind that you're gonna realize that a huge chunk of this was a confidence factor in feeling like you had to sing into someone else's supporting vocal, lead vocal as a guide track to you, when in fact you could have done it on your own all along, okay? Very interesting. Next thing is, um, there are uh, different forms of compression in the head. And with these compressions, I wanna talk about, um, the very, very first thing is, is uh, how do I say this? Um, do you guys remember me talking to you about when you sing with headphones on, and, and we have headphones on kind of loud, and the same exact music is playing ambiently in a room, right? So you'd have these headphones on, and they're pretty loud, and you're listening for a few minutes, and then when you take the headphones off, it's gonna sound like the music in the room is flat, or in a lower pitch, to the music that is playing in the headphones, okay? It's a Doppler effect. It's a Doppler effect. Right? When the music is played in the room, okay? Well, this same exact compression happens in your head at all levels of your range and volume of singing, okay? Now, this is gonna sound complicated, but it's really not. I just wanna make you aware of this. So if you're asking yourself, well, gosh, you know, when I do this, I'm consistently flat, or when I do this, I'm sharp, or whatever. Now, when we sing louder, there's a tendency for pressure to build up in the head, and we'll usually sing sharp, more sharp, to a track. When we sing louder, we're bellowing, we sing sharp to a track. When we sing softer, a lot of times we don't have support. Now support is king, and I'm gonna get to this later. And I was gonna have this be the first thing we talked about, but I've talked so much about it, I don't wanna be redundant saying the same things over and over again. So I'm gonna save it more towards the end. But um, anyway, so support is king, but if you're singing really soft, you're, you're, and sing so timid, there's a chance of going flat or really not having the strength to get to the, the calisthenics, so to speak, of a melody, if it's moving up and down, you don't have the strength to support it abdominally, okay? So it's really important that we get the diaphragmatic support working for us to sustain to support pitch, okay? It's not a throat problem necessarily, it's not a vocal flow problem, it's not, you know, my I'm, I sing super froggy or nasally or this, that, or whatever. It's chances are it starts right at support and then we work through the food chain of how we can fix this, okay? So anyway, um, so here's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast forward a couple of these because I had a lot of these I wanted to go through and I'm, <laughs> I'm already 25 minutes in and I've got like oodles and oodles of pages. But anyway, so as we go through this um, and we pick these simple songs and you feel like you've been able to, to nail a few of these songs, I want you to go ahead on um, this last experiment, you know, with the, with the karaoke version, pick something a little more difficult, not a lot difficult, something with a little more range, okay? It's okay to go into falsetto, it's okay not to try to stretch your chest voice up into the sound, all we're looking for is pitch and intonation. So challenge yourself, after you've done a simple tune, challenge yourself to something a little more difficult and a little more difficult and see how you do. And it's gonna take time, guys. This isn't something that happens overnight. You know, we train ourselves to do all of these things. But anyway, what you're gonna find now too is, 
is, is we're gonna do some simple exercises. I'm gonna get my guitar out, and we're gonna actually go over some stuff. But the greater the melody that we have, the greater the risk of drifting off of a note, okay? The greater the melody, the greater the risk of drifting. And once we drift, we lose something in our mind or in our brain called the anchor note. And usually the anchor note is either the main body melody that kind of repeats itself or typically the root note of the key that's being played. So if it's an A and I go ring, the note would be uh, right, ring, and then uh, that anchor note or the root note would be the anchor note. Now, when I say anchor note too, well, there's oftentimes uh, a root note will be an octave. So, a, 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 except for that middle one. See, even I have, a, right? It's early. I haven't warmed up yet. Anyway, so, um, so the anchor note is key because once we have this anchor or the mean average, the anchor of the melody in our brain, it's a lot easier to stay on key and we run the risk of drifting a lot less. But once we do drift, sometimes it can be hard to get back to base camp and find that anchor note, okay? So this is important. So, so we just stop for a minute, we reset, we get our anchor note back together, and then we can follow this melody with, with, a, with a pulley, you know, it's a, a, a tethering line, so to speak, to get us to our melodies and then tether ourselves back to this anchor note, okay? It's really cool. Once we understand how this works, it's really awesome. So, now, a really simple, cool ex uh, exercise to do, and I, I cover all this in my singing course, How to Sing Better Than Anyone Else, guys. I have an entire section on this, and yes, you know, vowel placements matter, pitch matters, compression matters, the amount of pressure in the head matters, all that matters. I'm not gonna be able to cover all this stuff in one session today, but I'm giving you a snapshot, I'm giving you an overview of how all this stuff works so that you can can experiment on your own and try this. So anyway, so now one note, this anchor note, where it establishes the pitch, um, and it is where all other notes are tethered to, okay? So all other notes are tethered to this anchor note within a scale, okay? Now, I'm not gonna even talk about scales today because there's a lot of scales, but what I'm going to say is typically, as we memorize a melody, it's basically a scale that someone's, you know, manipulated into a melody, okay? So why we practice a lot of scales at Contemplative Vocal Academy and why other Yahoo coaches say that scales don't matter, <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> strange. Um, anyway, is that it gives us not only intonation, but allows us the ability to work up motor skills in our vocal tract, which is our throat, it's our vocal folds and all, all whatnot. We have to work up and build muscle memory in the throat to accommodate different ranges, different volumes, different vowel sounds and so forth. Even vowel sounds we can get screwed up on and we'll talk about that when I talk about brightness and covering a sound in a minute. That's an important component to this. But anyway, so what I want you to do is I want you guys just to simply start by taking a note. I don't care what note it is, but I'm gonna give you guys a mean average note for so girls can join along with the guys, and I'm just gonna go hey, on an A vowel. And I want you to go hey, and that's the original note, that's my anchor note for this. This is in B flat. I chose this specifically because guys could sing this and girls could go hey. Guys, you can go hey. Now I just want you to only hit the one note. See how close you can resonate with this note. If you're off, it'll go Hear what I mean by the Cessna? Right? The minute I went off, you heard this like a wobbling sound, and then it started to come back in pitch. Now, I'm going way back to the basic of basics, guys. So, you know, if you guys, oh, can I, I, I have pitch problems, but not that bad. Hang on, I'll get to you two in a minute. So, anyway, so, and, and, and try this for those of you that think, well, my pitch isn't that bad. I just want some pitch tips or some tuning tips. So, what we're going to do is on this note, we're going to toggle off of it a half step. We're going to go, um, Okay, so what this is doing is, I'm gonna play it on the guitar so you can hear it, is I'm gonna try to do what's called forcing you off the note, 
right? I'm deliberately going to try to force you off the note. So you have to hold in your mind, no matter what, don't listen to this other guy over here. You're going to have to memorize this note and hold the line. Okay. Toe the line and hold the line for this note. Now, but we're going to start with toggling off the note. So we're going to go. Ladies. Okay, now if you're able to do that, a half tone is very difficult. A half and a, and a whole tone when you're singing a, the anchor note, when you've got an anchor note going. So now, now, now I'm gonna do this. Right? It's very hard to pull away from that whole tone and get to a half tone in pitch and then immediately come back to the whole tone. So we practice these little toggles back and forth between these things. Now, we're going to get into actually identifying notes in a chord and all kinds of stuff, but this is a really good exercise. Now, another exercise is reversing that. Instead of toggling off the note, I'm going to hold the anchor note and I'm going to try to get my instrument or I wish I had someone else in the room with me because it was a lot more pressure and it's a lot more difficult to stave them off and not listen to their note and not want to follow them. Just like you want to follow the guide in your favorite song and you want to follow that person in the, in the melody. Same thing is true when someone else is in the room. You gravitate towards wanting to do what they're doing rather than towing the line and holding your own note. So I only have an instrument. I don't have another person here with me. So you can do this if you have an extra person or you can sing it in your phone and then do it with, you know, playing your phone and then try to sing against it or whatever recording device you have. That's also very beneficial and very advantageous. So, but so instead of me doing the toggle, I'm going to do the toggle on guitar and I'm going to hold my anchor note. And there's, ooh, it pulled me off. No, it really didn't. I was just showing you being funny. Here we go. Right? Practice it with me. Hold that note. Don't let it pull you off. Right? Cool. So now what you've done is you've you've set up um, a, a, a an anchor or a mooring, so to speak. You've ha have a tethering note to tether to, so that once you're you've got this in a key. And Let me do something else. Watch, watch this. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna do it here. I'm gonna go. Now that note, if I go a half step off a whole tone, I know it's just like, oh, you guys can. This is too much technical information. Hang in there with me for a minute. I have to say something. So if it, don't tune out, just bear with me for a second. That half tone in a chord is called a major seven. Okay. So if I were to play that in 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 the same key that I just did, I went, and then I went. So here's that note. It's a very beautiful chord. So there's the original, there's the half tone. So you hear that? Okay, now I'm going to hold my whole tone and not let this affect me. So the chord's gonna go by and I'm gonna just sing my anchor note. Hey. Now I'm going to practice it the other way. I'm going to take the anchor note and I'm going to toggle and I'm not going to move the chord. Hey, right? So I'm now practicing and I'm memorizing and I'm becoming confidently strong in knowing what my anchor note is, okay? You're gonna find this is really important. I'm gonna get to more in a minute, but you're gonna find how advantageous this is and how this is gonna really help you as you're holding melody, holding the anchor of a melody that you've learned, okay? So we've done that. Now, next thing we're gonna do is I wanna talk about hertz frequencies because it's important. Now, uh, it, what I just played, there's something called A440. That's this note here. And, okay. That note is the universal note and how all instruments are tuned, okay? How all instruments are tuned. And it's really a good idea 
to really familiarize yourself with that one note. Now you may have find you have absolute pitch, very few people have perfect pitch, but you may find that you have absolute pitch and that one note is easy for you to identify almost anywhere. For others, it may not be. For me, I played guitar all my life, so if I was out in an audience somewhere, I know I've shared this before because I, I use a lot of wireless headset and, and guitar stuff. So if I'm out in an audience playing a song and someone bumps my guitar and it goes out of tune, I don't get the luxury of running back to my amplifier looking at a tuner and tuning my guitar, I've got to know what the key of that is. Now, I do have the band playing as a reference, so that makes it a lot easier, but if they knock out my guitar, I go, hey, let me give you an example of what I mean by this real quick. Watch. Listen. Okay. Okay, now I'm not going to use any pitch rev. See, it's out, so. Really? So watch this. Now, when we show you something really weird, watch this. Okay, I'm gonna take, take this way out of tune. Ooh, man, I'm, I used to be really good at this. <laughs> there it is. All right. Oh, you know why? Because I tuned down a little bit for a, a thing I did. <laughs> that's funny. Anyway, I can. <laughs> well, that's colleague on your face. Let's do this again. So, um, here's my root. Let me do this one more time. Okay, that's A. Okay, that's the key of A. Now, I was able to tune that back up because I'm used to hearing that. I should have practiced this a little bit more. Now, if we go through this, A440 is 440 cycles. So, in the key of A, the key of A, so wait, let me back this whole thing up. I even flustered myself there. And by the way, I'm not perfect, so even I have to go through this stuff too, so it's kind of cool this happens. Um, so, in the key of A440, that means a frequency that vibrates 440 times a second, okay? A vibrates 440 times a second. Now, why that's important is if we hear, if we hear this, here it goes, whoa, 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 whoa. hear that? All right, what that means is it's literally vibrating 440 times a second, whereas another key, let's say it's at a thousand cycles, it vibrates at a thousand um, times a second. Now, let me explain why this is important. Every time we sing a note, whether it's that A, or up to a D or a C or whatever the notes are, they all have a value, a Hertz value, okay? Now, this becomes really important because we have to understand that there is a, um, uh, there's are mechanics that are involved in this, okay? Very specific mechanics. And I'm gonna get into this as we start to do some chords. I'm gonna sing some notes for you and we're gonna go through these together. So when we understand that this is a technical thing, we hear it in our mind, we memorize it in our mind. Now we have to reproduce the sound. We go through and we reproduce this sound from a technical aspect, okay? We've gotta get that sound to come out technically. So now, as we go through this, as we, everybody's voice box, their larynx, their vocal tract, and all the size of their chords, etc., they're all different, okay? So your singing in a certain key is very, very, very important because you need to be able to sing in a key that's easiest or what's called your tessitura, something that's the easiest thing for you to sing in. Now, with that said, I'm gonna go through some, some different things and I'm gonna discuss different people's vocal fox and types, but here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start doing a couple of, of uh, let's see here, right here, I'm gonna grab this right here. We're gonna go through some notes and we're gonna sing the root. Actually, I'm gonna do this all the way in the key of B, okay? By the way, I was able to tune the guitar again really quickly without a tuner, okay? That was what my point was, what I was trying to show you before when I couldn't get to it as quick as I wanted. But anyway, so I, I, like I said before, I'd be out in an audience, someone would knock, knock my guitar out of tune and I'd have to tune it back up really quick. So let me just do this one more time. So if I go, and I go, boom, I'm in tune. Let me do it again. Boom, I'm in tune, okay? That's what I was gonna show you before. <laughs> I had to redeem myself. Anyway, so we're gonna go through um, in, in B, and we're gonna just sing the anchor note. So just go. You can pick any vowel you want. Now I want you guys to learn what the third, the major third of the chord is. So I want you to go. Sing the anchor note first. Uh, ladies, you up the octave. Uh, 
Then the fiddle. And go back and forth between the root. Ladies. That's the beginning of understanding how to use the, the root note, the anchor note, into the start of a melody. That would be a melody against the root note or against the key that it's in, okay? Now that you hear this and you go back and forth, you can play with it a little bit more. You can go, ah, ah, ah. okay, one, four, and five, we're gonna go here. Guys, and just practice this and see how you how you fare, how well you do getting back. Now let's let's go from the third to the five, right? Go or one, four, five. So we're gonna go. Something that simple. And guys, this may sound really simple to you, but for you guys out there that struggle with pitch, hey, you might even still be struggling with this. So we're gonna do this again. Okay, now do you hear how exact my pitch is? I, I've been doing it a long time, so it's easy for me to get there. Um, but what I'm pointing out to you is, is as you do this, you're not being thrown off the note. You're not getting pushed off your note. Instead, you're dominating the chord. You're dominating the root note. So this is really, really awesome. Now, there's crazy stuff you can get into, which are chromatic half tones. You know, um, right? You want to get really good at this and hear how your intonations. Get your tuner out and see if you're really, you know, how your intonation is working on, on in a chromatic scale. But so now that now that we know this, okay, we can pick out things in a chord. So let me show you something kind of cool, okay? I'm gonna play a seventh, okay? And this note, you know, thriller, right? Remember me telling you that a half tone was hard to do? So, so we have, you have the B, and then that seventh, is a full step away from the root note. That's why I wanted to talk to you about the little technical aspects before, so I wouldn't lose you. So as I explain this part, it will make sense to you. So here you have the root note. So while this chord is gonna be played, we're gonna start with the anchor note. Ladies, okay. And we're gonna move it down a full step. Now, by the way, I sang it without the seventh in the chord. So it's harder to dominate the chord if that note's not even in the chord. Now, the coolest thing ever is when people write songs, a lot of people that write a melody, they don't care so much about whether that note is in the chord. They'll write a great melody and hope that the, you know, try to get the chords to accompany or accommodate the melody that they're writing. But for the sake of ease, let's do it again. And I'm gonna go three. So there's that seventh. Now we're gonna do. So I'm gonna do one more note. I'm gonna do a major seventh. We just talked about this. So, uh, so we have, and then the half tone, and then the seventh. Okay. So remember the the the, the major seventh. We just sang a little while ago. Remember toggling back and forth. Uh, I know I'm losing some people, guys, but if you can hang in there with me for another minute, I think you'll really appreciate this, okay? So, uh, 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 that half tone, when we go to do this, and then, right? So we're gonna actually, we're gonna walk through this from a seventh to a major seventh. So we'll start in the whole tone. Next one is, 
Now the reason I'm doing this is, where have we heard that melody before? Something in the way she moves Feels like no other lover Right? Okay, so what did we just learn? Well, we learned a Beatles song that it was only one note that sustained the whole melody that was just moving chromatically a half tone and then a whole tone off the melody. Now, this is why I'm bringing this up because there's a visual aspect to this too in our minds. Remember how our minds, all of a sudden we know that we have this melody embedded in our minds. So if I said, hey, can you sing this melody? Something in the way she moves feels like no other lover, right? I could probably tell you, hey, can you sing that? And maybe most of you can if you know that melody. Then when I showed you exactly how, how this was played on the chord, so. There's something in the way she moves feels like no other lover. Okay, so this is how we do it, guys. This is how we practice. This is how we identify chord structures. This is how we identify melodies. And I've got a lot of notes here and I'm not gonna be able to get through a lot of them because I've got so much still more that I wanna cover and I wanna be able to answer some questions. But remember too, guys, I was singing in a pretty even pressured voice, okay, even pressure. I wasn't singing too loud. I wasn't singing too soft and it was supported, okay? Now, if I say something in the way she moves, it, I would probably over sing the chords and have a tough time finding that in my throat and finding not over singing the melody. <coughs> and it hurts if you don't do it right. So anyway, intensity of range really matters. Now, I told you I was gonna talk about vowel sounds, dark tones and or covered tones and bright tones. Now, as I'm doing the same melody again, I want to point this out to you. I want you guys to listen. I'm going to do something called covering a sound, which means making it really dark. Now, when we cover a sound, or we sing a sound really dark or really deep in the throat, oh, like we have cotton in our throat, okay? It really inhibits our ability and kind of handicaps us a bit from hearing pure tones. So the brighter the tone, the easier it is or the more on display that pitch is to, to a melody or to a chord, okay? The more frontal the sound is, the more bright the tone, the more you can hear the pitch, okay? So if I go. Right, okay, now I did something for you deliberately. I deliberately sang that flat. I deliberately sang it under the pitch of, of the melody and you probably didn't even really notice the difference because it has a lot of, let's call it forgiveness for lack of a better word, because it's so covered you can't make out the pristineness or the precision of the melody, right? Or whatever note value that we're singing. Now, if I sing it really bright, I couldn't get away with that. Something in the way she moves. Something in the way she moves. I'm still flat on both parts, both covered and bright were flat, about the same amount, but you really heard it when it was bright, right? So the goal is, is if we're really looking to hear intonation, we want to keep the sound nice and bright. So, something in the way she moves, feels like no other lover. Okay, so the brighter the tone, the easier it is to hear the pitch. Now, I cover that in my singing chorus because you guys all remember, ping is king. We discussed this in my singing chorus. Now, so the bright tones illuminate the exactness of pitch while dark tones are less clear. Right, so now, the next thing is, and I'm just gonna, <laughs> I was like, whoa, these notes. I was gonna do two or three more songs, but um, I think you get the point. Anyway, so the more we close down this sound also, the more covered a sound is, or the darker the sound is, chances are our tongue is going back into the throat and it's kind of choking off the vowel. So what we need to do is go back to my video on open throat technique or get my course or whatever, but open throat technique and train that tongue to stay down in the back of the throat, 
to get this clarity and this freedom of what's called open throat technique. To sing with an open throat so you don't have stricture or being constricted in the throat to inhibit your ability to get to these different notes. Now, what I also do too is, um, before I get move on on this, I, I should have done this because um, that's one thing I don't want to forget. When we sing a melody, we don't have to sing uh, the vowel sounds and the consonants. First, if we're just trying to find intonation and pitch, we don't have to do that. So what we could do is on one vowel, sing the melody. Okay, so we start with one vowel first so that we're, we can find it easily in the throat. Okay, because it's the minute we go from vowel to vowel, that's why we get caught, it's why we get discouraged, it's why we go off, we get pushed off of our pitch from a mechanical standpoint in the throat. So then we can migrate from that all the way to moving the vowels without any consonants. So, uh So I just did it without the consonants because the consonants, especially hard glottal stops or hard consonants, close down the back of the throat and we have to reopen up the throat every time we sing a line. Every time we close down the throat, the throat says, hey man, look, can you make up your mind? You know, do you want me to be closed? The epiglottis comes, it closes down, it's trained to referee. Are you gonna drink some water? Is it gonna go in the esophagus? Or you know, is it gonna, like, tell me where this, is, is air coming in or out of the throat? Like, how am I gonna manage or referee this? So what happens is, is when we close down a consonant, the throat is saying, do you want air to come out of the mouth? Or do you want air to come out of the nose? In other words, if I go, Mm, or baby, so if I go, um, baby, you're mean, and I want nothing to do with you, no, mm, 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 right? If I'm doing that every time I close down my mouth, air got shot up into the nose and the back of the throat is trying to figure out how to place the vowel. So if we train those vowels to stay open, I cover that in my singing course, it's what we've been talking a lot about, contiguous phrase singing, it's much easier to have a consistency in the throat to find intonation, to find pitch, okay? So again, guys, these are all, all things that all matter. Um, and they really, really help with maintaining this and giving you the confidence that you're looking for uh, to get into pitch and get this intonation and whatnot. Now, th there's different forms of training pitch and I can't go into all of them. This is just a few. S there's a whole concept on seeing notes in color and it's actually pretty cool. I used to think it was kind of bogus until I, d I got really into it and saw some of the successes of it. And so a lot of people can actually associate a color to a tone, right? They can go, okay, that's blue, that, so it should be this note, that's red, it should be this note. I can't go into that, but there's a whole theory on that, which is, it is actually really cool, and they do it with melodies also, um, and it helps with uh, tuning, for absolute tuning. Um, but anyway, so now another thing is, when we use this pitch reference, and I wanna say this uh, clearly too, the anchor note is the most important note we can memorize or what is the, the root note of a, of a key that we're in. So I'm gonna do this for you and then I'm gonna take this open for some questions because um, you know I'm sure we're gonna get a lot of them and I've got a lot of, um, uh, I, I wanna talk about a couple more things that have to do uh, with different vowel placement and different vowel movement. Because vowels, are, I'll start this now and then I'll, I'll, do what I, I'll, I'll get to what I was gonna do in a second. The vowels themselves, the higher up we go, become smaller. Okay, let me say this again. The vowels themselves, the higher up we go in a melody, become smaller. So there's an interaction in the throat on the bottom. If I go, right? Did you notice as I went up, my sound got smaller? It's because my throat needs to get smaller to accommodate singing that note. Otherwise, it'll be too big it will splat or become top heavy and not sustainable. So I have to pare down that vowel sound. Well, that's true for all vowels. So as we go up, we have to make we have to make exceptions for these vowels as we go up. Now this is more advanced tuning, guys. So you out there that's saying, oh Ken, this is way too much information. Let me just go back to your karaoke thing and I'll try a couple songs and see if it works. 
I'm doing this for the more advanced guys out there. So what happens is, is the more the range, remember I said the more difficult it is, because you have to negotiate big uh, changes in the throat from small compressed sounds up top to opening up those sounds on the bottom. And every time that melody bounces around, you have to adjust that in your throat to accommodate this. So anyway, gang, this was a lot of information. There's more down here, but, um, and if, if I didn't cover enough, I'll try to revisit this again. I have a singing course. It's called how to sing better, better than anyone else. I cover all this stuff in my course. I cover all these vowel modifications. I cover support. I cover, you know, contiguous phrase singing and, 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 and. So Ruben says, hi, Ken. Someone told me that it is impossible to sing on pitch all the time without using auto. <laughs> oh, Ruben. Oh, Ruben. Oh, Ruben. There, first of all, because we have been trained in a culture to not think for ourselves. That's the first thing. The second thing is I do it all of the time. So, you know, so let's just do it right now, Ruben. You just said, someone told me it is impossible to sing on pitch all the time without using autotune. Something in the way she moves Feels like no other lover Right? I could, or I'll do it a cappella with no instrumentation. Here we go. You ready? Something in the way she moves feels like no other lover. Right? I can sing like that all day long in pitch and notice something in the way. I didn't go off key. I didn't go off pitch. So Ruben, that poor soul believes that auto-tune is their answer. What did they do before auto-tune? <laughs> At Ken Tampa Vocal Academy, we never use auto-tune. We sing in pitch. That's what this whole thing is about. So Ruben, they're wrong, and I'm proud to say they're wrong. Uh, let's see here. Um, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah, how do you sing high on pitch? I can sing on pitch low, but lose it when I try to go to belt high. That's what I was just discussing, is that there are different compressions in the head, and we have to make adjustments for them. So if I go here, let's say I go, right i just sang in a few octaves there and i had to make an adjustment every time i'm adjusting for compression in my head i'm still adjusting Okay. So each time I do that, I have to make an adjustment in my head, just like what I covered at the beginning of the session today, in order to be able to accommodate that pitch. It's a balancing act of pressure in the head. So next one, here we go. Ruben again says, uh, these tips pe uh, give, these, or excuse me, those, pe those tips people give, like imagine the notes, stuff like that. I feel like works sometimes, but when you're on stage, you won't be thinking of every note, right? Well, no, because you're building a muscle. First of all, when you say imagine a note, by the way, I know where that came from and it's bullshit uh, and he's bullshit, um, sorry. But, and I usually am not a swearing man, but I'm tired of people just giving out bad information that confuses people. We envision a note. It's not like, oh, I'm, you know, all of a sudden I'm gonna do some magic wizardry here and I'm gonna just imagine I can sing this note and hit the note. Guys, why would you, first of all, why would you give yourself over to chance like that every time I go to hit a note, like, if I could only imagine, right? No, no, we, we, we memorize our notes, we build up to our notes, we build muscle memory for our notes, we build strength for our notes. All of this is a process that we work out with strength training in the gym so that we're so consistent at it, we do it so often so that when we do get on stage, we're thinking about entertaining people, we're not worried about hitting the note. That's the answer to that question. Anyway, simply the best. Hi, simply the best I can. I'm a male baritone, and I was just wondering what note should I start my scales when I warm up? Hey, good question, dude. Hey, Gaston, Gaston's on my buddy. Um, it depends on, on where your baritone range. If you're high berry like me, I usually start myself as I'm warming up. If I'm doing a lip drill, I'll start as low as a low A. Right? I'll start down here. Some berries start here, higher berries. Brrr. 
And it's a good idea if you're a baritone not to go above the F sharp first, F sharp, that note. So in chest. You can go beyond that in head voice if you're kind of just relaxing in the throat, trying to wake up the voice. So you go. You can go up up to about a B or a C5, B4, C5 in a head voice and, and wake up the voice gently and then little by little, if you're doing my course especially, I don't know if that's a question of someone doing my course, you can you can definitely warm up the voice to at least an A5 or farther as a baritone. Tenors, you guys got to go all the way up at least to the C5 or higher uh, without a doubt. All right, my buddy Gaston, Gaston, when I started singing, I couldn't match any pitch. Did you hear that? By the way, let me tell you who Gaston is. Gaston is the one I just put, uh, just posted Pour Some Sugar on me on Facebook. He's uh, got, we've done a few songs on my YouTube. He's one of my students from way back. He's also teaching in Mexico. Um, and he said, when I started singing, I couldn't match any pitch. So I know anybody can. It does, it t uh, does take time and commitment. That's coming from Gaston. Go on my, my YouTube channel and check out Gaston uh, Uruguay. I think he's, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that's your last name on my video. But look up Ken Tamplin Gaston and go from a guy right now who says, this is unsolicited guys, who says, I couldn't match any pitch and listen to his the quality of his voice now from spending a little time on it. It's worth doing that guys. Ruben, again, <laughs> Ken, can different parts of your range be difficult to find pitch? Yeah, I said that. So in other words, you said, like, I find my chest register easier than my head voice. Often people do that because we speak and we call out in our chest register. So we do that more often. So we're more used to that, more accustomed to our speaking and call registers than in our head voice registers. And like I said, the higher up we go, the more compression that builds in the head, the more we have to make that adjustment to find that range and pitch. Okay. Aaron, have you ever used guitar tuner to practice pitch? No, I have not personally, but I heard other people have all kinds of cool little pitch devices that they do it. Do it for a little while, but don't use it as a crutch. Do it just to kind of make sure first and then put it away, get your recorder out and see if you match the pitch without the tuner. That's where you want to end up. Mark, big learning curve this week. I let go of my support on the way down the scale and I go flat. Exactly, Mark. I'm so glad you brought that up. I'm going to do a whole thing on this. Um, Mark said, big learning curve this week. I let go of my support on the way down the scale and I go flat. So that's the reason I have all these different exercises in the course, one of them being the sit-up exercise. The reason I have you do a sit-up and sing a scale is if you're at the top of the sit-up and the top of the scale, if you let go of your support, you're going to go bam and crash your head on the ground, right? Nobody wants that. Well, the same exact thing happens when you sing. If you let go of the support, bam, you crash and you go flat. You lose strength in the sound. But it's just like the sit-up. And you keep strength coming back down the scale. You don't go flat. Now, why do people do that? Because people think, Ooh, hit the high note, man. I don't have to support anymore. I'm good to go. Wrong. You have to stay in support. Support has to still be involved as you come down off the note or you'll do exactly what Mark said. You'll go flat. If you don't, you won't. Plain and simple. All right, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna answer one. Can singing in distortion struggle with your pitch? Yes, in fact, um, dis distortion actually compresses the folds themselves. It narrows the ability to find pitch. However, some people actually uh, get so accustomed to singing with strain in distortion, distortion and strain, that the only way they know how to get to pitch is by distorting their voice and it's a very, very, very bad habit to embed and develop. This will be uh, the last two questions here. Uh, I'm not able to sing in pitch in my passaggio. They're generally flat. Yeah, good point, man. Hey, Gray, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, that's because you haven't supported and sustained muscle strength and memory in the passaggio yet to sustain the sound. How you deal with that is back off both sides, the chest voice and the head voice volume almost down to nothing until it can match 
the ability to sustain pitch through the passaggio and the connection without hearing the break. And that's the key, that's the holy grail to growing the passaggio. And then little by little, when the passaggio can handle more volume, you can bring up the volumes evenly, end to end, chest, passaggio, and head, passaggio back to chest. You can bring up the volumes gently, incrementally, a little bit at a time to strengthen that passaggio in order for that not to happen. Rainbow, uh, do you think it's worth experimenting with different frequencies, 432? 440. You know, um, a lot of people are on this big 432 kick and I understand why because supposedly it's a more of a universe resonant frequency. Guys, don't laugh at this. This is actually legitimate. You know, you can laugh all you want, but we just heard that music itself is a frequency. So don't laugh if there's other frequencies that are more compatible with uh, even our nervous central nervous system and things like that. You know, you can, but it's not going to do you any good when it comes to singing in the real world because everything's tuned to 440. So, gang, thank you for joining me. Um, God bless you guys. Uh, I will not be next Thursday. I'll be here next Saturday. And hopefully this information was helpful. Don't forget, I have a singing course called How to Sing Better Than Anyone Else. I also have a new course called Voice Repair. It is not how to, it's not my, my flagship course. It's a course for people that are struggling with vocal issues, everything from, from sinus issues to, you know, mucus on the cords to polyps, nodes, legions, etc. Like I said, I am not a physician. I don't claim any medical advice, but it's life experiences that I put in to help um, that's sort of kind of like a pre-workout for those that have my course. It's a good little pre-workout if you're kind of struggling with some, you know, hoarseness issues or this or that to get your voice back on track. And then you go back and do my course after um, after warming up with uh, voice repair or just staying in voice repair to get your voice back online. Okay. Thank you again, guys, for joining me. God bless all of you. And until next time, peace out. <laughs>